right, Mark chapter 3 is we're going to be in Scripture this evening. Mark chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse 1. And we're going to read the first six verses of Mark chapter 3 this evening. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. The Bible says, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. <clears throat> and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill it? But they held their peace, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. If you read the Gospels with any regularity or have studied them to any degree, you come to see that the Jesus versus the Pharisees and the religious rulers of the day is kind of like a cat and mouse game. Only it's a cat and mouse game that we understand Jesus is in control of because he is the Son of God. But there's always a back and forth. And here we see the Pharisees, the religious rulers of the day, they are watching Jesus just like, again, the analogy, a cat watches a mouse. They've decided they don't like him. They've decided that the, everything that he stands for, everything that he's teaching is against their way of, of, of thinking and against their doctrine, against their theology, and so they're against him. And that's, that's the only reason they come to see him is to find something they can catch him in, some way to accuse him, to try to denigrate him in front of his followers. And so here is another one of those situations where Jesus is healing, he's getting ready to heal on the Sabbath day. The Jews permitted healing on the Sabbath day only if there was danger that the person might die before the next day. I think that's so interesting that there was some sort of rule or regulation within the Jewish law. Uh, we don't find it in Scripture, but within the Jewish law that says, well, healing's permitted on Sabbath days only if the individual needing to be healed is in danger of their life before the next day begins. But that's what one of their little nitpicky rules were. And they were upset that Jesus was going to break that rule. And rather than focus here on Jesus in this passage, I do want to focus a bit on these religious rulers, these Pharisees that are watching Jesus, because I see in them, I'm afraid, some characteristics that we're not careful we'll find in ourselves. And tonight, for the next few minutes, we're going to look at the outline of a bad attitude. The outline of a bad attitude. This uh, Sunday morning, this, this morning, my Sunday school class, we were talking about living out our faith and uh, tr learning how to walk what we talk. And in the book of 1 Peter, we're beginning to study through the book of 1 Peter in that Sunday school class. And where he begins there in chapter 1, in verse 13, he says to gird up your loins. And I'm not going to reteach my Sunday school class lesson, but he says to gird up your loins. The idea is the, the loins of your mind, rather. Gird up the loins of your mind. And the idea is that we're getting ourselves mentally prepared. We're getting ourselves mentally ready. And the point of today's lesson was that all of my activity, my actions, my words, the type of person I am, it starts back in my mind. And that's where it, it, it outflows from. And so here we see these men, of course, we understand ultimately this would be the group that would accuse Jesus and, 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 and get uh, the, the authorities to allow them to put him to death. The Romans would end up crucifying him. But it all began with a thought. It all began with an attitude. And we see this attitude permeating them over and over and over throughout the Gospels. And if we're not careful, I'm afraid we'll find ourselves with a bad attitude all too often. And sometimes, I think, without even realizing it. And so tonight, for a few moments, I want to look at the bad attitudes we see here in the Pharisees and make sure that these sort of attitudes are not taking place in our own hearts, in our own minds. James 4, 17 tells us, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Jesus did good, didn't he? He healed this man's withered hand. Now he healed him on the Sabbath day. This nitpicky rule, he, he ended up, uh, crossing the line, but he did good. He did right. He healed this man, and rather than rejoicing about the man being healed, the Pharisees left the synagogue, and they take counsel with the Herodians. 
very interesting that we see them counseling with the Herodians because the Herodians were people who were interested in uh, uh, the rule and the reign of Herod. They were uh, uh, very political uh, and, and involved in Roman politics, and the Jews had no, absolutely nothing to do with these Herodians. They weren't interested, and they were totally against and in a disagreement with the Herodians and, and what they had planned and, 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 and their goals and plans. But we see them teaming up together because neither of them liked Jesus. You've heard the term, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? That's exactly what's going on here. These are two enemies who happen to have a common enemy in Jesus Christ, and so they decide that they're going to ally themselves together. But we see, again, this awful attitude going on within the Pharisees as a group. So let's look at three components of the bad attitude we see here in the Pharisees. Number one, we see a critical eye. A critical eye. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. We'll reread them together. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. So the he and the him there in verse 2 is Jesus. Now we talk, they're talking about a man with a withered hand in verse 1 coming in, but in verse 2, the Pharisees are watching Jesus. They know this man has come into the synagogue, and he needs to be healed. They know how Jesus tends to heal sick people that are in his presence. And so they begin to put two and two together and think, hmm, Jesus is probably going to heal this guy, and it's the Sabbath day, and this man's life isn't in danger, so he shouldn't be healing him according to our law. So we're going to watch Jesus because I bet he's going to do something we don't like. That's their attitude here. They've got a critical eye. And how often and how easy it is for us to develop a critical eye, especially towards those that we may disagree with, someone that we may have decided we don't really care that much for, maybe philosophically we don't see eye to eye on things. And if we're not careful, I, hey, we, we've all done this. Hopefully we're all old enough and, 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 and humble enough to at least admit it to ourselves. Someone that you don't like, no matter what comes out of that person's mouth, no matter what they do, what they say, no matter what sort of situation you find yourself encountering them, you're going to find something to pick out about that individual. A critical eye. We tend to look at people, especially those who have done us wrong or those we may disagree with, with critical eyes. We're looking for what they are going to do wrong. We're expecting them to disappoint us. We're expecting them to irritate us. We're expecting them to make us angry, give us additional reason to dislike them. These Pharisees had a critical eye toward Jesus. Now, I, I imagine that most of us, because we are church people for the most part here tonight, I would imagine that most of us wouldn't have a critical eye, at least intentionally, toward Jesus, toward God, but I guarantee you we're dealing with some sort of critical eye towards someone we know. It's part of having a bad attitude. It's the attitude we find in the Pharisees, the people that we want to be nothing like in the Bible, being critical. A man and his wife pulled up to a gas station to refuel their car. This was back in the days of full-service gas stations, and the men would come out, and they'd start to pump the gas into the car, and then they'd go around and wash the windshield. The man and his wife were sitting in the car, and the gentleman washes the windshield. The man looks at the windshield, and he says, that windshield's not clean, sir. He rolls his window down. Windshield's not clean. I want you to wash that again. So the man very patiently gets out, washes it again. He goes to walk away, and the man calls him back over. Hey, hey, this windshield still isn't clean. He washes it a third time, and at this point, the owner of the car is exasperated. He says, I'm going to go inside and talk to your manager. I can't believe you don't know how to get a windshield clean. Before he goes, gets out of the car, his wife reaches over and grabs his glasses, and she begins to polish the glasses, and she sticks them back on his face, and he realizes that the problem was not with the windshield washer, but the problem with him was with him keeping his glasses clean. And I'm afraid very often that's how our attitude towards others works. Maybe they're not so guilty as you may want them to, to be in your eyes. The problem is your attitude toward them. The way that you approach them in your own mind, in your own thinking about them, a critical 
eye. Critical people view others through their own dirty glasses, the dirt on their heart, the dirt that they've allowed to accumulate in their minds affects how they see everybody else. And if we're not careful, that sort of attitude can, get, can gain momentum in our hearts and minds and we look at everybody that way. We've all known individuals like that, don't, haven't we? I can remember my mom's mom, and I've mentioned her before, in, 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 from the pulpit before, she, she passed many years ago. And, and I have no doubt that she loved me and that she loved my siblings and she loved my mother but she couldn't show it. She's one of the most negative individuals I've ever met in my life. And when I found out she passed away, my knee-jerk response was guilt because I was so relieved I didn't have to deal with her anymore. This is my mother's mother. She spent the last 10 years of her life in our home. Such a negative person and such a critical eye no one could do anything right in her eyes. And friend, you and I know people like that, and those attitudes and those outlooks, they wear on you, don't they? And God forbid we become those people. But I guarantee you the individuals in your life and in mine that are like that today, they didn't start that way. It came from, from things creeping into their heart and creeping into their mind and, and this critical eye and looking at each, everyone else and critiquing them all the time and year after year after year and person after person and relationship after relationship and they just became negative all the way around and no one wanted to be around me. And I don't want to be that way. I don't want to turn into that sort of person. I want to share another illustration with you. A father, a son, and a donkey were traveling from one village to another. The boy was walking while the man rode the donkey. As they're walking down the path, the father overheard a band bystander say, that's a shame. Look how that man is making the poor boy walk. So not wanting to be the object of criticism, the father and the son changed places. The boy rode the donkey while the man walked. He then heard a woman comment, look how that boy on the donkey is making his poor father walk. The father and the son both climbed onto the donkey. As they traveled down the road, someone said, look how that man and boy are making that poor donkey suffer. They both got off and walked. Someone else remarked, look at the stupid man and boy. They're walking when they could be riding a donkey. And when they entered the next village, the boy was walking and the man was carrying the donkey. Hey, we're always going to find someone who can critique and find fault, and pick out, and let's not be those people. Hey, there are times when constructive criticism can be helpful. But a lot of the time, criticism does nothing but hurt someone's feelings and make them feel bad and make them not want to be around you. So let's be careful of our critical eyes. Let's be careful of judging Others. The Bible does say to judge, but it says to judge righteous judgment. And we have to be careful how we critique others. A critical eye. The second part of these Pharisees' bad attitude is a concrete heart. A concrete heart. Look in verse 3 of Mark 3. He saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Now Jesus is speaking to the man with the withered hand, and then he turns to the Pharisees, and he has this to say to them. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill it? But they held their peace. Now look at verse 5. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved of the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. It's interesting to me, again, if you take the time to really study the Gospels, you'll see so often Jesus showing mercy and grace and love and patience and understanding, even to the Pharisees. Oh, he had a lot of hard words for them, and, and, and he didn't pull any punches. But even here, he knew what they were thinking. He knew what was going through their minds and through their hearts, and he took the time before he healed this man, to call them out, to address what they were thinking and what they were feeling, to try and help them with their bad attitude, with their hard hearts. 
And the Bible says that he looked around on them and he was angry. Why? Because he was grieved for the condition of their heart. Jesus was sorry that there were individuals who were in his presence who had seen him work miracles and yet still turned their minds, turned their hearts from the truth of who he really was. In spite of the fact that these men would be the very ones to lead him to the cross, Jesus still tried to deal with the hardness of their hearts. These people had concrete hearts. Jesus is grieved. The Bible, where the, uh, the Greek word is translated as hardness can also be translated into the word stupid. This was dumb. These guys were just being plain old stupid, weren't they? In their thinking, here, Jesus Christ is performing a legitimate miracle. Man, if we had the opportunity tonight to see what they saw, we'd line up to pay for tickets. But these men see it, and because of the hardness of their heart, they're still not interested in accepting Jesus to be who he really is. They'd made up their minds, and even the Son of God wasn't going to convince them otherwise. And here's my application from what we see in their attitude here, this concrete heart. When is the last time that you felt your heart, your mind, your spirit warmed by the Spirit of God? When's the last time that you felt that God was speaking to you? I'm not talking about an audible voice. I'm not talking about a 50-foot Jesus in the air. I'm talking about an impression in your heart and mind that you knew that God's Spirit was dealing with you maybe in some encouraging way through a song or a passage of Scripture, maybe convicting you through a message, through a lesson, maybe in your own personal devotion time, just showing you something you'd never seen before, noticed before, thought of before. When's the last time that you remember God's Spirit speaking to yours? Friend, I I'm afraid that if it's been a while, then maybe we should reflect on the condition of our own heart and on whether or not we have a hardening and a hardened heart like we see here in the condition of these Pharisees. They're standing in front of the Son of God, and they're watching God, Son, perform miracles. And from what we can see in the text here, these men knew it was coming. They'd seen miracles from Jesus before, and yet they'd made up their mind before any of it happened that they didn't want any part of it. And I'm afraid if we're not careful... We allow, even those of us who attend church, and attend church regularly, I mean, you guys are a Sunday night crowd, right? Showed up on Sunday. You've already come to church once today. You may have even come to Sunday school and been to church twice today, and you came again. And that's, that's awesome. It is. It's good. But I'm afraid, even coming to church regularly, even being exposed to God's Word and its teaching and its truths on a regular basis, if we're not careful, our heart will be hardened and God's Spirit will have a hard time speaking to ours. When's the last time you felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit? When's the last time you felt the presence of God move in your life, in your heart, in your mind? If it's been a while, then maybe you need to do some thinking, some reflecting, some praying. Maybe your attitude is headed down the same path we see in these Pharisees. And lastly, we see in verse 6 a conniving mind. A conniving mind. We see firstly in their uh, uh, attitude a critical eye. Then we saw a concrete heart and lastly a conniving mind. Verse 6. The Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. And I mentioned already these Herodians were a group of individuals that the Pharisees wanted nothing to do with. They weren't buddies. They didn't go out to eat together. They didn't hang out with one another. They weren't friends. The only reason they had anything to do with the Herodians that day was because of what they felt about Jesus and their sorry attitude and their conniving mind and spirit. Again, these men had just witnessed Jesus, the Messiah, perform a miracle, but in their minds, they'd seen a blasphemer commit a horrible sin. You see that? I mean, what we see clearly as Jesus confirming once again that he is God's son by performing a miracle, these men see a blasphemer committing a sin. 
Their mind is made up about Jesus. Let me ask you this. When you leave church, when you leave a church service, a Sunday school class, small group, whatever, when you walk away from church, what do you think about what you experienced? As you reflect on what you just spent your time doing, what comes to mind? Um, I've mentioned this before, but being the music minister here, it's easy for me to walk out the door, especially on Sunday morning, and begin to critique everything that took place on the platform. Aside from the preacher's preaching, unless I'm the one who did the preaching. Okay, I'm not critiquing Curtis. But if I'm the one that did the preaching, I definitely am. But I'll critique everything that went on. How the sound went, like this morning. We got everything ready to go. Everybody's in place. And I start to greet everyone. And I hadn't turned my stinking microphone on. It took me through the first song to get past that in my mind because I was so irritated. That was so unprofessional. Not that I'm professional, but you know what I mean. I want everything to go right. I want everything to go a certain way. I want it to, to sound right. I want the perception to be right. And I'm afraid too often I walk out of a Sunday morning service and my mind is only thinking about what went wrong, how things didn't happen exactly like I wanted them to happen. And I think we should strive for excellence in everything we do. We should do our very best with whatever it is we're doing. And this is what God has called me to do and placed me here to do, and I want to do my best doing it. But I'm afraid too often I allow my attitude to sour. Not from anyone else's fault. I'm not preaching at anyone but me here. Don't misconstrue anything I'm saying. But allow myself and my own critical spirit to uh, keep me from experiencing all that the Holy Spirit wants me to experience in our church services. When I walk down from the platform and the pastor comes to speak, whoever uh, comes up to speak, it, it takes me a moment to sort of disengage from what I've been a part of and really pray God speak to my heart. Help me to receive what it is you have for me. And I know that my experience may be a little bit different from yours, but every one of us walks in here with some sort of experience coming in. We've got some sort of circumstance going on in our lives. There may be uh, relationship issues. There may be financial issues. Uh, Curtis talked about it this morning. He was talking about uh, we should try to be happy today. We all have things going on in our life that keep us from being as happy as we want to be, right? And we struggle with those things sometimes. And if we're not careful, we'll bring that stuff into the service with us and allow it to affect our attitude in such a way that we miss what God has for us. I know that's happened to me before. And I think if you're honest, it's probably happened to you. As you walk away from a church service, has your heart been warmed by the truth of God's Word? Have you been challenged or convicted by what you heard? Have you uh, been encouraged by <clears throat> what you experienced in worship with your brothers and sisters? Maybe hearing them sing or maybe knowing that as you were singing, others could hear you and perhaps it was an encouragement to someone else. What kind of attitude do you walk away with when you walk away from church? Or is your mind occupied with other things? I've been, had the privilege to be here at Cornerstone for over 19 years now, June. First Sunday of June will be 20 years that I've been here at Cornerstone Free Old Baptist Church. And so I've had this perspective looking out at worshiping saints for a long time now. And it's always interesting to me. When I was a very young man and started, it was insulting to me, but I, I came to realize and understand and learn that your experience is not about me, it's about God. But it's still interesting to look out over a crowd and over an audience. And boy, you can tell very quickly as you look from face to face and from one pair of eyes to the next who's engaged in what's going on and who isn't. Inevitably, there are people that are checked out of every service. Especially on Sunday mornings, there are particular individuals that tend to be a little bit narcoleptic and nod off a bit in the service. But I, I wonder how our attitude is influencing what we're experiencing. 
and I know that what I'm preaching here is really just the idea of, of our, 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 our experience in worship and in a church service, and, and I don't mean it to just be that, but our experience outside these walls, our, our Christian experience as a whole, my attitude is influencing and affecting it. And if I've got a critical eye, if I've got a hardening concrete heart, if I've got a conniving mind, it's, it, it's, it's influencing and tainting my attitude and my Christian experience. These men walked away that day just that much more determined that they were going to get at Jesus. There were others that walked away that day convinced of who he really was. And so these two very different experiences at church that day because of their attitude. I'm going to give you one last story and we're done, okay? We've looked at three different elements of an awful attitude and a sorry attitude we see in the Pharisees. Number one, a critical eye. Number two, a concrete heart. Number three, a conniving mind. A lady by the name of Carol decided she wanted to do something nice for her neighbor, Mrs. Smith, so she baked a pie and carried it next door. When Miss Smith opened the door, she was surprised to see her holding a pie. She replied, for me? Oh, thank you so much. You just don't know how much I appreciate it. I'm so grateful for you doing this. Thanks again. Because Miss Smith liked the pie so much, Carol decided that she would bake her another pie. She took that pie over, and Miss Smith opened the door and said, thank you so much. This is so kind of you. Carol took another pie over the following week. Miss Smith simply replied, thank you. Carol took another pie over the next week, and Miss Smith responded, you're a day late with the pie. The following week, Carol baked another pie. This time, her neighbor said, uh, try using a little more sugar and don't bake it quite as long. The crust has been a little bit hard lately, and I'd really like cherry filling instead of the apple filling next time. The next week, Carol was so busy, she was unable to bake a pie for Miss Smith. When she passed by her house on the way to the store, Miss Smith looked through the window and noticed she wasn't carrying a pie. Then she stuck her head out the window and hollered, Hey, where's my pie? And I'm afraid that's the, exactly the sort of attitude that we have to guard against when it comes to our Christian experience. Hey, everything that I have, Curtis mentioned this morning, it's a gift from God, amen? But we tend to look at it as a right and not a privilege. And it's a privilege to be a part of a church. It's a privilege to be a child of God. It's a privilege to have the health to attend a, a church service. And all these privileges, these, these gifts that God has given us, if we're not careful and we let our attitude sour, we see them as rights and we expect God to keep giving. And when he takes away and doesn't do as we expect him to, we think we have the right to a sorry attitude. It's all because we've allowed our attitude to sour and our gratitude to stale. James chapter 4, verse 5. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? You know James is talking about here? He's talking about the tendency of the human heart. Really, what he's talking about here is to a degree what Curtis was talking about this morning. Always tomorrow. Oh, if I could just have the next thing, the next paycheck or the next uh, vehicle or the next home or the next whatever you want to fill in the blank and we're never satisfied we're always lusting we're always envious we always want more we we can't ever get enough and it goes back to an attitude that's souring much like we see with the pharisees here friend i don't know about you but i don't want to be anything like those pharisees nothing like it and the way i keep that from happening is by guarding my attitude. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.